The show opens up as our protagonist, Georgia Lass, sits in a waiting room when Dolores, her career counselor at Happy Time Corporation, calls her for an interview. Georgia has an unimpressive CV with little experience or education. During the interview, Dolores comments on how unhappy and unqualified Georgia looks. In response, the teenager sarcastically replies that being too happy hasn't landed Dolores in a high-paying job either. Later at home, Georgia's mother, Joy, berates her for quitting college and being unambitious. Georgia, being passive-aggressive, willfully uses the word moist to describe her food as her mother thinks the word is pornographic. The following morning, Joy reveals that Dolores had contacted her earlier. Surprisingly, Georgia was hired in a temporary clerical position at the Happy Time Corporation. Joy wakes her daughter up and lays out fresh clothes. However, Georgia, who does not want to work, sarcastically says that the clothes look like ones worn at a funeral. Irritated by her insolent behavior, Joy warns her to get to work quickly or else there will be a funeral. When Georgia reaches Happy Time, she finds out that the clerical job is the one Dolores gives to people she hates. The monotonous job involves spending all day in the warehouse, barcode scanning piles and piles of files. Despite her, Georgia begins to slack at work. But, even as she tries her best to do very little work, everyone else in the office does a lot less. The poor teenager begins to realize that she might have to spend the rest of her life in a dead-end job. After a while, Georgia goes on her lunch break. On this day, the Russian Mir space station is plunging into the Pacific Ocean as is expected. But some debris, including the seat of a zero-gravity toilet, flies off from the space station and heads to the west coast of the U.S. In the meantime, Georgia has a slightly creepy encounter with a man on the streets during her lunch break. The middle-aged man asks her the time and her name and knows her middle name despite meeting her only a few seconds ago. He then touches the back of her head, leaving ghostly white fingerprints. On the other hand, Georgia walks away irritated, only to be met with a horrible accident. The zero-gravity toilet from the space shuttle strikes her with tremendous speed and kills the teenager on the spot. After a huge explosion, people begin running chaotically. Georgia, in her sole form, stands some distance from the impact site, looking on without any knowledge that she is already dead. She approaches and sees one of her mangled shoes just as a man runs right through her. A few seconds later, she is approached by a couple of undead people, Rube and Betty. The duo are grim reapers tasked with taking the souls out of the dead bodies and taking them to the afterlife. Meanwhile, Georgia quickly goes through several stages of death. At first, she refuses to believe she is dead, exclaiming that she did not feel anything. Even when the debris hit her, Rube explains they usually take the soul out before impact when it's a violent death as a courtesy. Georgia then goes through anger and tries to bargain, offering to take someone else's soul. And finally, when they say no, the poor teenager is forced to accept that she is now dead. The following day, Rube, Betty, and Georgia go to the latter's funeral. There, Rube explains that normal people can see him and Betty as they are undead, but not Georgia as she is dead. After the teenager's final rites are over, the trio leave her house. Later, at a Waffle House, Georgia learns she isn't heaven or hell. Instead, she is going to be a grim reaper. Betty and Rube explain things. They have custody of souls from the moment they die until they go on to the afterlife, about which little is known. Each grim reaper has a quota of souls to pass on before they get promoted. The middle-aged man who asked Georgia the time before the toilet fell was a grim reaper, too. Georgia was his last soul, and now she has to take his vacant position. So begins Georgia's grand new role as a grim reaper, whose responsibilities are divided into several specialities. In her case, she will be working in external influence, which includes murders, suicides, and accidents. The scene shifts to Roxy, another grim reaper, reaping someone who died from a piano dropping on her head. However, Rube disapproves of her actions because Roxy didn't take the soul early and waited until after the piano dropped to reap her. Suddenly, Georgia notices a little gremlin-like creature running up the building from which the piano dropped. It's a graveling, one of the creatures that caused the accidents and set events that lead to death in motion. Rube calls them part of the balance, the greater order of life and death, which has to be maintained. A few paces ahead, they find another reaper, Mason, who is accompanied by two souls he reaped who killed each other in a crack den. Rube takes the two souls and asks Mason to take Georgia to her new home and show her around. The duo then go to an apartment that has recently become vacant but not registered as vacant as it was bought through illegal money. It is then revealed that Grim Reapers live in inhabited homes of recently dead people and move when a normal human shifts into the place. Meanwhile, there are several dead bodies in the place, which freaks out Georgia. Mason is not even slightly moved by the corpses and points out that they all been killed by professional execution. 
and torture. He adds that the criminals that did this will certainly clean up the bodies pretty soon. In the meantime, he goes through their pockets, searching for money and valuable possessions. When she expresses reservations about stealing from the dead, he asks if she wants to get a day job. He reveals that grim reapers are not paid, and most of them get by on what they can from the dead. Soon, Betty comes into the apartment and says she has already claimed the flat. Georgia asks if she can couch surf with either Betty or Mason, but they both refuse to take her in. Afterwards, she learns that while she still looks the same to other reapers, she looks different to the living humans. Later, Georgia accompanies Mason to his next soul reaping duty in a bank. He advises her not to meddle in anything, because even a little change may affect the outcome. He then casts his experienced eyes over the room and tells her the many ways he can see people potentially dying. On the other hand, George sees a graveling and notices the creature place a banana peel on the floor. She immediately tells Mason that the upcoming death will be caused by the banana peel. However, he doesn't seem to notice the graveling and doubts her prediction. Meanwhile, the only information about the subsequent death that Mason has is a name which begins with B, an address and an estimated time of death on a paper. He says that's helpful, so they don't get attached to their target. Soon afterwards, a rather inept person named Brett starts a bank robbery. A few minutes later, Becky, the wife of a bank staff, barges in seeking her husband, Brad who is having an affair with a colleague, Brenda. The devastated Becky has a gun and doesn't care about the robbery. She holds the staff at gunpoint to learn how long Brad has been cheating on her. She fires a shot into the ceiling, which ricochets around Byron, the bank manager, and hits a gas cylinder, causing an explosion. A few minutes later, the fire department arrives just as bank robber Brett tries to run. He stops and turns near the banana peel as he tries to dodge the authorities, but does not step on it. He then runs when the coast is clear while the security guard takes down Becky and disarms her. Through all this, Mason and Georgia are on the floor as amused spectators. Then, in comes an aloof customer, Brendan, to cash a check. Mason sees his name on the check and touches him, leaving behind white finger marks. As Brendan is told the bank is closed, he turns to walk out, slips on the peel and falls with his head in the revolving door. The firemen try to barge in through the door and accidentally snap Brendan's neck, killing him. In the following scene, Georgia gets to stay in the recently deceased Brendan's home. Living alone, she reflects on her change of life and how her mother used to look after her and she wouldn't have to do her laundry. On that note, she goes home and sees her mother is having a yard sale where she is selling Georgia's stuff. The newly made Grim Reaper tries to ask her mother herself. Joy, who doesn't recognize Georgia, honestly replies that they didn't get along but also mentions that Georgia was smart. Devastated by her daughter's death, she judges herself for not being a great mother. The next morning, Mason wakes Georgia and takes her to their Waffle House morning meeting with the whole Grim Reaper gang gathered around. There, Rube hands out notes with new souls to be reaped, including one for Georgia. That night, Rube and Georgia arrive at a train station for the latter's first task as a Grim Reaper. He tells her the seat number and estimated time of death of her client. Furthermore, he warns her it is going to be a violent death, so she'll want to take the soul early. Soon after, Georgia gets on the train and starts an inner monologue about how hard it is to consider what's going to happen. She fantasizes about the possible death being an awful person, just to make it easier to deal with. Unfortunately, an innocent, small girl named Christy sits on the seat where the death is to happen completely devastating the new Grim Reaper. She stares at the child and, at the window, where a graveling appears. As the time of death approaches, Georgia walks down the aisle to leave her fingerprints on the child, but she can't bring herself to do it. Eventually, she sits next to Christy and starts talking to her. Unable to let the kid die, Georgia tries to lead her away from the danger zone, but she's stopped by a railroad employee who is keeping an eye on her. Suddenly, the train carriage becomes uncoupled, and everyone falls to the floor. The train then derails and crashes down a bank through the woods. When the carriage comes to rest, the employee checks to see if everyone is okay and counts all the survivors. Surprisingly, everyone survives, including Kirsty. While the survivors gather, Georgia goes into the woods, finds Rube and grills him for not telling her it was a little girl. He tells her it doesn't matter and that they cannot change fate. As death is none non-transferable, Rube reveals that only Georgia can take Kirsty's soul. He warns her the child's soul has expired, and it will now rot inside her. Although he agrees it is cruel, he points out that she can't save anyone but can make the death easier. Following this conversation, she returns to the circle of survivors and reaps the child's soul. 
Kirsty collapses instantly, and the other survivors try to resuscitate her in vain. In the meantime, Georgia and Rube lead Christy's soul away. Suddenly, the sky lights up and a portal of shining light funnels down, forming a glowing ground full of adventure rides. Seeing this, Kirsty runs off to it, and the whole structure then moves back into the sky. A clueless Georgia asks where the little girl's soul went, but Rube tells her it's not for them to know. A week after being dead, Georgia is on the toilet in the apartment that she is staying in when Brett's parents show up. Although the parents are suspicious, she manages to pass herself off as his girlfriend. Meanwhile, Georgia's little sister, Reggie, has been telling the neighbors that her mother won't let her go to the bathroom. When her mother confronts the little girl about this issue, Reggie cannot give her an explanation for her actions. Elsewhere, Roxy is busy earning her living as a traffic warden with Mason looking on as she works. Currently, a businessman yells at her for writing a parking ticket, but she doesn't let the matter escalate by flashing her gun. This ends any objections the businessman has with Roxy. In the next scene, the narrator narrates how the appointments for the upcoming deaths are done. Rube gets an envelope put under the door of his apartment from an anonymous figure, and from that, he writes out little notes of all the upcoming deaths. Then, he hands out the notes to the Grim Reapers at their next breakfast meeting. The following day, in the meeting, Rube forces Georgia to work with Betty for a day as a punishment for her interference with Christie's death. Later that night, Georgia and Betty hitchhike out of town to their destination because they don't have money for a taxi. Georgia is wary of hitchhiking, but Betty politely insists she get in the car of the stranger that offered them a lift. It is then revealed that the man who offered them a lift is their target. As Georgia watches on, Betty charms the man with her beauty. A few minutes later, Georgia imprints the man with the soul-claiming touch. The two ladies then abruptly get down from the car in the middle of the road, and the man dies in a car accident a few meters ahead. Meanwhile, after his instructional day with Roxy, Mason tries to pick the lock of a parking meter for the money inside. When lock picking fails, he pulls out a baseball bat and knocks the meter off the pole. Later that night, in a cafe, Mason distracts Roxy and George by eating the gum from under the table. However, he expertly manages to sneak the key to the parking meter off Roxy's belt. On the other hand, George's mother, Joy, has to go to school because Reggie has stolen a toilet seat. At dinner, she reveals that Reggie took all the toilet seats in the school and sends her to bed. Later, she tells her husband, Clancy, that she wants to take their daughter to a child psychologist. But Clancy dismisses the idea. Back in the Waffle House, Georgia whines to Rube about how she hates being a grim reaper. However, he gently tells her to suck it up and hands her a note, giving her their next target, the server of the Waffle House. Soon afterwards, some naughty kids throw a cherry bomb down the toilet, which causes a sign to fall on the server. However, Georgia manages to touch the server before he is killed. But she, too, gets impaled with a fork. But reapers heal awfully quickly and the wound barely affects her. Later that night, Georgia decides she's done with being a grim reaper, and thinks that Rube can't force her to do further jobs. So the next morning in the Waffle House, when Georgia goes missing, Rube slips a note under her door. To the teenager's surprise, a mysterious wind blows it closer to her feet. She tries to ignore it for the day while it preys on her mind. What exactly happens when grim reapers refuse to do their jobs? When the time of the death comes, she misses the appointment, and the note gets even closer, impaled on one of the springs in her mattress. Then a graveling visits her, and she worries if she would get penalized. To make matters worse for the new grim reaper, a note is left on her door demanding rent. She discusses a day job with Mason who is very against the whole idea. However, she doesn't trust everything Mason says because he died by actually drilling a hole in his head because someone told him it would give him a permanent high. Later, Roxy arrives at the spot where Georgia and Mason are having a conversation, and she rams her vehicle into Mason at speed. She then takes back the key that he stole, and delivers the news that Rube wants to see Georgia at a nearby morgue. There, the teenager gets to see the body of the man whose soul she didn't reap. While his body is dead, his soul remains trapped inside the body, witnessing the doctor's tear into his chest during autopsy. Horrified, Georgia protests it was not her fault but reaps his soul. Following this, the soul of the man comes out, desperately thanking George. Rube gives her a simple lesson on cause and effect. What she does or doesn't do matters and has consequences, and tells her to say she's sorry. She apologizes, and Roxy takes the man away. Later, Georgia visits her old house and watches her sister sneak out after another neighbor arrives to complain about Reggie. Georgia follows her to find a tree that she has covered with toilet seats. 
This makes the Grim Reaper reflect on cause and effect, and how what she did affects her sister. Hence, Georgia decides to keep going. She isn't finished liking things. She hasn't finished not liking them. She hasn't finished living. She goes to the Happy Time Agency again to see the annoying career counselor, Dolores, using the pseudonym of Mildred. Surprisingly, Georgia, now known as Mildred at the office, gets a job as an office secretary. On the other hand, the Grim Reapers continue their job of reaping souls. The following day, Georgia and Rube arrive outside a petrol station that keeps a real live bear in a miserable small cage as a tourist attraction. This animal abuse is being protested by some activists. They hold hands, forming a chain and try to convince people not to buy petrol at the station. Meanwhile, given her last two performances, Rube decides to accompany Georgia in this task. He gives her some other hints, as well as makeshift plastic covers from bin bags for when the deaths are messy. The head Grim Reaper then unveils a simple plan for finding out who their target is by calling their name. When one of the activists replies to the call, Rube tells her to reap his soul with a simple handshake. Soon, Georgia sees a graveling moving in near the bear cage. Lo and behold, the activist guy quickly gets mauled by a bear, spraying the onlooking Grim Reapers with blood. Right then, Mason arrives with a garbage bin bag around his body. Rube then points to another of the dead activists, who is Mason's target. Ho, oh, she is already a ghost now and has graphic facial scars. Once again, Rube points out to the new Grim Reaper why souls are reaped before death. In the meantime, Georgia continues to go to work as Mildred to get enough money to pay her rent. There are several office politics, events, and cliques at her work but she remains indifferent to all of it. However, she feels disturbed by Dolores being in her cubicle, trying to break into her work computer. Currently, Georgia is late but covered in blood, which lets her play on Dolores' sympathy for a day off. However, when she realizes that she won't get paid if she goes home, Georgia borrows some clothes from Dolores and continues her day at the office. At Georgia's old home, Joy is wrangling her little sister Reggie, who wants to go to school on picture day wearing the dress she wore to Georgia's funeral. It is clear that the little girl hasn't let go of her sister's death as she has kept George's pajamas safely in her wardrobe. Concerned, Joy makes a desperate attempt to talk to Reggie using the example of her shaky relationship with her own mother, but the little girl barely pays any notice. Outside, George is watching as Joy tries to give Reggie a sweater and ends up dropping it in the driveway when Reggie refuses to take it. Even while acknowledging what a bad idea it is, Georgia grabs the sweater and then lets herself into her old home. Inside, she finds old pictures and toys to be precious, while before her death, she had casually ignored them. She also does Reggie's math homework for her since she knows her sister hates math. Following this, Georgia goes into her old room, which is now all packed up and cleaned by her obsessive mother. She is there to take some of her old clothes but falls asleep on her bed. When Reggie, Joy and Clancy return, Georgia is still in her room. However, she wakes up just as her dad talks about missing dinner again. Unbeknownst to Joy, her husband is having an affair with a student at the college he teaches. Fortunately, Georgia manages to sneak out a window and throws her sister's discarded sweater at the house's front porch. Unbeknownst to her, Reggie notices the garment and realizes it has moved. Later that night, Joy tries to help Reggie by encouraging her not to think about her sister's death if it hurts. But soon afterwards, the little girl goes to her deceased sister's room with an Ouija board. Elsewhere, Georgia goes on a job with Betty to retrieve the soul from a body stuck in a tree. After several unsuccessful attempts to climb the tree, they resort to throwing rocks instead. During this, Georgia asks lots of questions about souls, but Betty doesn't have an answer to them. Finally, Georgia tells Betty she went home and the latter tells her it's a bad idea, even if no one saw her. Trying to get back what you've lost doesn't help when you are a grim reaper. Although Betty says taking their old stuff doesn't help them from moving on, she has her own flashback to digging up her body to get her ring back after she died. Eventually, they succeed in bringing down the dead body from the tree and reap the soul. Taking advantage of this moment, Georgia tries to make friends with Betty, but the latter dodges her. The following day, Georgia is woken by Mason, and they talk about the weird dreams she has been seeing lately. But after Mason borrows a big knife, he leaves the apartment for his new job. Meanwhile, at work, Georgia feels left out because the whole office gathers for someone's retirement. All the while, she's left attending the phone calls and emails. This surprises her since she doesn't actually want to be part of the office yet feels lonely when left out. That night, Mason and Betty go on a job, filling in a personality test while they wait. Shortly afterwards, he goes into a building with the knife he took from Georgia, leaving Betty behind in the car. Soon, several gunshots are heard, and an injured man rushes out, chased by Mason. They circle the car for a few minutes while Betty reads out his personality results from inside. Suddenly, another man comes out and shoots the wounded guy again, giving Mason a chance to reap his soul. 
However, Mason gets shot himself, but he escapes with the bag of money that the injured man was carrying. Betty, who is now alone with the dead guy's ghost, asks a personality question. Later, at the Waffle House, just as Georgia joins the other Grim Reapers for a meeting, Rube sternly lectures her about visiting her old life. He gives her a final warning that if she goes to see her family once more, she will be heavily punished. However, the warning doesn't go down well as Georgia points out the worst has already happened to her. Following this, Rube hands everyone their new tasks, and Georgia has to go back to the bear again. This time, people are protesting the pending euthanasia of the caged bear. Roxy tries to sit in silence as Georgia keeps asking her to guess how the death would happen. When Georgia goes for the man in the cage with the barely sedated bear, Roxy points to the name Dee Kostakovich, means that the black man in the cage is unlikely to be the victim. They enter the crowd, and hearing the news presenter comment on how he changed his name to something easier, to say, George guesses he's the man. Just as the bear escapes, an unfortunate electrocution causes the reporter to be frozen on the spot, as the bear attacks him. But she has his soul and also saves the bear from being shot by a guy with a handgun. Against all advice, Georgia then goes home and talks to Reggie, until Joy arrives, sends Reggie inside, and starts to close the door. In desperation, Georgia calls her mom. She tries to recount a story from when she was a child to make Joy believe it's her daughter. Instead, the mother screams at her, assuming she's a con artist, and Georgia runs, watched by Reggie from the window. She is then picked up by Roxy, who takes her to the Waffle House. In the final scene, Georgia tells Rube she went home again. Rather than get angry, he asks if she's okay and if she lost anything, like memories. She says she can't remember the childhood memories she tried to tell her mother, and asks if all they can hold onto from their old life are thoughts and memories. In response, he tells her it's all they have, while we see an old black and white photo of a woman in his wallet. 